All right. Welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, Mike Ham. We are here today with Barry Costner. Barry, welcome to the show. Great, Mike. Thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's really exciting. I'm very excited about getting into the podcast world. Believe it or not, this is my first podcast but you're going to make me a star. So that's we right. We're on the right path. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah. So that, that is my goal is to make you a star, but for the people that don't know you, and I'm assuming they don't because this is your first podcast episode. Um, let's, let's fill them in. Like who is Barry Costner? Well, I, you know, I, I grew up in, in Canada, had an interesting background in there. I really enjoyed growing up in Toronto and uh, you know, I had the real privilege of, of going to MIT um, which I enjoyed very much. I was strongly academic. I, I wanted to be a mathematician. I think my dream was actually to be a history professor, to believe it or not. So I had the privilege of, of going there. And when I graduated in the early 90s, the funny thing is that's when technology was getting hot. Half of my friends went to the internet world and I thought, oh, this makes no sense. This is never going to last. The valuations yes. were crazy. And the other half went to uh, Wall Street and consulting. So I ended up, I spent a year in consulting and then the next uh, 10 years or so was at Merrill Lynch and Goldman Sachs. So that was kind of my my little journey, which is yeah. still continuing. Right, right, exactly. Still <laughs> continuing. So take me through like what you're doing now. So I, I know we have a lot of stuff to get to and a lot of stuff to talk about, but give me like broad strokes, what you're doing right now and why you're on this podcast circuit right now. So I, I split my time. It's very interesting. My focus has been lately capital markets. You know, how do you run a public company? How do you find companies that deserve to be public, to get capital, to make them public, to get a valuation? And I split my time in half between two different worlds. One is the world of SPACs, which is a real hot topic. About half of the IPOs in the United States right now are actually SPACs. Another name for it is a blank check company. I, I raised $119 million actually in December, and I have about uh, three more SPACs lined up in the near term. And the other half of my time, which is really near and dear to my heart, is uh, together with some investors, we, we took an interest in a, a OTC company, you know, trading at the time it was trading about a nickel, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and I have a family business involved in online education at EdTech. And we're in the process of bringing that technology for education and online degrees into an OTC listed company that we currently have an investment in that also right. has a very interesting live event business with the goal of eventually building that up and taking it public the same way, you know, in a similar result as a SPAC. So gotcha. Yeah, that's very interesting too, because you mentioned that, you know, you raised $119 million. You're working, you know, on other different companies, getting them public, going public, all that kind of stuff. So can you take me through like what the process is like of taking a company company public and being able to raise that kind of capital that quickly? Right. Okay. I really appreciate it. And that's that's what's so intriguing to me. And I I call it is like looking at the universe of how it is that you go public. And that's why I like to say I'm involved in two things and they're so different because in today's world, there's tremendous value of being on NASDAQ. They say the value of just the listing itself, forget about the business or what it does for the business because it's so difficult to go through the process of getting a NASDAQ listing. It takes time and capital, legal work, effort. You know, the valuable, especially since Reddit, the Reddit and the meme stocks and all that stuff with COVID, yep. They say just the listing itself is probably worth $10 million. You know, wow. if it's 10, maybe it's five, but it's definitely more than five. So, so the point is the, the path with a SPAC, it's very interesting because a SPAC is basically a private equity fund wrapped in a public listing. So it's two steps is you put together the management team and the business plan and you put out what's called an S1, which is a, a legal document offering through the SEC, where the investors see what it is that you're doing. And the interesting part of a SPAC is the $100 million basically goes into a trust account. So part of the reason it goes to the SEC so easily is because you're IPOing cash, which means nothing, right? right. That yeah. is, if I want to, you know, when, when a regulator reviews a public company, they say, you know, what are the financials of this company? What is the vision of this company? Is it fair what they're saying? Is it reasonable? What are the disclosures? So if my business at the IPO is just a checking account with cash in it, there isn't really that much to review. So that's why it's kind of like a two-step process where the first part of a SPAC is you, you have the IPO. Then what you have to do is identify a company, come to a definitive agreement, and then you have normally about a 12 month time frame where now you have to go back to the SEC where I'm not just a checking account anymore. So the NASDAQ part was easy. 
So yeah. now I need to get the agreement from the shareholders. So the SEC and the shareholders need to agree to the combination. And then you have that public offering and you have 12 months. And if you don't get the approval of that deal, you actually have to give the shareholders back their $100 million. So that's the twist yeah. on a spec. It's kind of like a unique vehicle. And because it short circuits the legal side of getting to a NASDAQ offering, there's been so many of them. Right. Is there, uh, are there companies that like, I know there's obviously like a benefit of going public and all that kind of stuff. And you mentioned how you were taking like a, a stock that was worth like a nickel, you know, like, which doesn't seem like it's that valuable to as someone that doesn't invest in the stock market. Like it's, you know, I'm looking at it from a very far view. Um, but take me through like maybe, you know, when would a company know that it's a good opportunity at that moment to go public? You know, what you just said is, is really interesting because it's 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 not about the company it's about okay. the management like do they really want to be public and this is actually okay. you know i i made the mistake because look everybody they have visions they have ideas they want to raise capital and so what will happen is funds or investors will come to you and say oh hey mike you've got a great business you know people need to raise capital you need five million dollars to take your podcasting business to the next stage let me put you inside of a public company and we'll get you the $5 million. And so, and the other thing is, is you, you know, you have your neighbor next door who's a wealthy guy and he believes in you. And he says, you know what, I'll write you a check for $5 million. Give me, give me, give me 50% of your business and we'll work together just the way you have your business right now and take to the next level as a private company. Yep. Right. So that is the, the story over there. Um, so, so the point that I, I, I'm making here is that these are the two paths. But if you're going to go down the public path, you have to really want to be public because as right. a result of being public, there's a whole separate layer. There's a whole separate layer of infrastructure. There's a whole separate layer of costs um, that you know come with being public that you wouldn't have as a private vehicle. So you have to decide, gotcha. do I want to be public? Do I want to go through the grief of running a public company? But if you do, you say, you know what, especially for a podcast guy is good because being public, it means being public, telling the world about it. So if you're willing to be public and tell the world, the consequence of those costs and effort is that you can have a much higher valuation, which is typically seen in public markets. Got it. I understand now. You know, so like if I if, if I want to, you know, then that would be the process that I go. <clears throat> and then $5 million sounds amazing. So, you know, maybe we'll have to talk about how I can get $5 million doing this. So, um, but, uh, <laughs> um, okay. So I want to shift gears here a little bit because I know we want to talk about legacy and I know that's, you know, like one of the things that you're working on now. So let's talk about like what legacy is and what the opportunity is behind legacy. Right. Okay. So, so the interesting thing about legacy is, um, Legacy is a, it has an amazing history of Robert Kiyosaki, a rich dad, poor dad, is a famous bestseller. He has a very inspiring vision that, you know, avoiding the, the handcuffs of a, of a cushy job. You know, today, everybody's got a side hustle. Everybody's doing creative businesses, working for themselves. You know, when he created this concept, it was really cutting edge. And it still is, the truth is cutting edge, is giving people advice, you know, financial management. He says a very inspiring thing. They don't teach about money in school. Right. I mean, it's really a crazy, crazy statement. They don't teach about money in school. And I mean, I think there's a bit of a conspiracy theory about it that it's not really helpful to society. They want you to become a nurse or a doctor, or a lawyer and pay your taxes. You know, they're not looking for, you know, really creative entrepreneur. The wealthy guys don't pay taxes. You know, yeah. they're not really, <laughs> yeah. you know, 50% off the top. So schools aren't. And so Legacy built a hundred million dollar franchise of mentoring and live events and sharing with people how to take back their lives. Because, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, up on the stage, telling the story, it's inspiring. We were working with Tariq El Moussa on House Flipping, you know, all these celebrities, they get up there, Tony Robbins, they'll pump you up. That's really not what education is about. It's, inspiration is great, but it's now sitting with somebody who's been doing it, who's part of that team, who holds your hand and says, you know what? I'm going to help you achieve the vision that we just inspired. So right. that's what really legacy education is about, is they were, had that partnership with Rich Dad, Poor Dad to give these educational live events and long-term mentoring agreements. So what, what happened is, you know, fortunately, Mr. Kiyosaki, he had some health issues a few years ago. That relationship didn't continue. And then even worse than that, you know, COVID, you know, hit the rails here. Nobody goes to hotels for live events anymore. Right. And the company 
became distressed. So it's like I said, in, in Canada, what we have a joke is, how do you start a small company in Canada? You start a big company and wait for it to go down. <laughs> so the same thing is, that, you know, sometimes like people don't realize they look at these OTC companies trading at a nickel and, you know, nobody goes public to trade at a nickel and have a $4 million valuation. Right. Know, this is a company with hundreds of millions of dollars of, of revenue, global footprint. I mean, they spent over $10 million alone just on their accounting system. I happen to have a background in IT services. You know, the, the accounting infrastructure is <coughs> extraordinarily valuable. We have sales guys. We have a call center of very talented people in the Philippines. So I came to this and said, okay, you know, the company is not working right now, but it is an amazing platform. So then, you know, I was speaking, my, the genesis of this is my family has a business in online education <coughs> that's very successful in a local community. And because of my background in public markets, I said, you know what? I look what goes on in ed tech. You look at Coursera, $2 billion. Udemy, yeah. $2 billion. To you, $2 billion. These companies are all bleeding. And I don't even think they have a right model of how to do online education, which I feel that my family business does. So I said, you know what? Let me take this. We think we figured out how to deliver online degrees. Sure. I view it more as career. career. You know, we're focused on the career. Nobody should do education is not an online degree. And so it's, it's how do we now use that legacy infrastructure, the legacy history, the relationship with rich dad, poor dad, the sales, the social media expertise, and bring into it the technology and content for the online education to not really build a, a substantial company. So, you know, it's still early stage and, you know, we're sure. very excited about it. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about like what makes it different. Like, so you, you know, you mentioned Coursera. I feel like people that are familiar with online education have heard of Coursera and it's gigantic, but you, like you're talking about how, you know, maybe like the way that they do things maybe isn't the most efficient way or the best way or whatever. Right. So what makes legacy that type of like the, the better, I guess better, right. you know, we'll, we'll, we could put that in air quotes if we want, but you know, like <laughs> the way that you see, you know, like the education system and the way that it operates, like what, like what's the big, the major differences between the right. two. So the, so the interesting thing is I think, you know, everybody is now so focused on digital and look, I'm an MIT guy. I'm, I'm getting involved in social media. I definitely believe in digital, but the analogy I like to give is virtual reality versus augmented reality. You know, not everybody wants to sit with this, oculus headset and have their life going now into the meta world i'm like yeah. i'm yeah. not so i don't know I'm, I'm i don't not, know about that <laughs> it freaks me out a little bit i might not come back side, if you think about for instance augmented reality like a heads-up display having some creepy glasses where i'm looking at you and all of a sudden i see your bio and your bank account that's cool you know yeah. it's yeah. like you know augmented reality is a totally different topic so i'm saying the same thing like in the digital world you know, what Amazon did is amazing. It kind of blew away Barnes and Noble. You know, a book can be a, not only a totally online experience, but a better experience. But on the flip side, something as like heavy as like a four-year college degree with your career and the life you're ahead of you, is that really something you can put into your Amazon cart and just sit there and watch some videos? Like that does not, it's not, first of all, the education part is great because to cut out all of that nonsense of, uh, not nonsense, I really enjoyed going to school. Not everybody sure. does, but yeah. you know, if I can just boil it down, because you know, take a course at MIT, it boils down to like 15 hours of lectures. That's, by the way, happens to be free. So as I can take the best content in the world and make it free. But the part of a degree where I feel you need mentoring is like, why am I getting a degree? You know, people need sure, guidance. Sure. You know, why am I here? I want to get a career. How do I do that? And it's a complicated topic and you need some handholding of like, these are the courses you should take. This is the way to get there. This is how you, you get that degree. Like, so a, like a guidance counselor, almost like a guidance counselor. You are really good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very, I'm, I'm pretty bright too. You're you know, I didn't go to MIT, but I'm a, I'm a smart guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It took me a while to get the words out, but you, yeah. actually, you actually got it. All right. Episode over. All right. Thanks, Barry. We'll see you All later. Right. That, that, I have to say like the real, what I see is that the magic piece of our business yeah. is actually guidance counseling. Is I it's yeah. the, the professor I can put on video. You know what right. I mean? That's totally cool. But what people need today, they need mentors. And really more than that, especially on top of education, the right answer is a guidance counselor. Sure. Yeah. That's really what we're looking to provide. 
Yeah. So t- take me through like, you know, cause obviously like we, we talked about a little bit before we started recording about, you know, the, um, the differences, or, you know, you went to MIT, you know, like a electrical engineering degree, all that kind of stuff. Like you obviously have like a high end educational background. Um, and then now operating in this space, you know, were you seeing, um, I'm not gonna say issues, but just kind of like maybe, um, you know, potential flaws in the current education system and like a hole that needed to be filled. Is that is that basically what we're talking yeah, well, about here? You know what I like about it is I wouldn't say necessarily a hole, but you know, the beauty in today's society with digital technology is it's really unbundling. Is like you can really break down, you know, what is the technology? What are the different pieces? It's not yeah. one-stop shopping. So I like to separate out, you know, the knowledge from the degree. And so I think that's that's really is like there's amazing technology out there for delivering knowledge. And it happens to be free, which is why, you know, it's very interesting that like people don't even realize we look at Coursera, yeah. the majority of their revenue comes from these certificates, which, you know, they're not proctored. You know, nobody's watching you. Nobody says you didn't cheat. So I don't even understand. I'm, I, I was joking with one of my investors that I have something called open library because the content actually is not copywritten. You know, MIT has like 4000 lectures. They don't belong to MIT. They belong to the world. It's a gift to society. Right, <laughs> you know? right. So yeah. I actually created this thing, Open Library, where, and, and I think I don't want to get lost in a sea of information. So instead of 4,000 lectures, I picked, you know, 20 from MIT, 20 from Yale, 20 from Oxford, um, and, you know, all of these, these different courses. So I have, you know, my favorite ones here where it's easy to get at no cost, right? Right. So, so that, that's the story over there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, remind me, it's almost as good a story like I said when I was on Maria Bartiromo, you know, podcast, you know, I think there's a little bit more room for casualty. I was literally sitting with Maria Bartiromo and had my phone go off, which was, yeah. you know, that was cool. So yeah. it's, it's like, it happens. <laughs> it's all good. That's, like that's the world we live in now. I mean, yeah, if I had kids, is. they'd probably be running around right now. I, like, I want a dog, but I probably won't get a dog because he's going to start barking as soon as I start recording these things. No, that's just I what happens. This podcast business, I'm telling you, we're going to replace Maria Bartiromo. I, I, it was amazing. <laughs> they have this huge building. The whole focus of that building, you feel like the queen ant in the beehive. It's all yeah. focused on you. We're going to see this podcasting business, such a big opportunity. We're going to get you a building for you, just like Maria Bartiromo. So okay. I, I won't have my kids coming on the set then. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm down, Barry. You let me know how we do that. We'll, we'll get it figured out. Um, so also take me through like, you know, so you're talking about the the knowledge versus the degree, which I think is really interesting. And I think we've seen like the education system kind of get shooken up a little bit because people are realizing that they can, you know, not come out of college with X number of X amount of dollars in debt and start something or get a job or start working or go to a trade school or whatever it is. So it's kind of like reshaped the way people have viewed the, the college experience or the educational experience. So also take me through, like, are these things that like, um, you know, these courses that you're offering people, are they kind of uh, like anything? Could I like go and yeah. take a course I mean, on? We've, we've actually got know. like 200. Once again, is, is I don't, it's, I'm not, I'm not focused on the education piece. The education piece is very important. I'm focused on accreditation. Our real focus is, but we don't want to take people's money unless we deliver. So if somebody, yeah. you know, this is, we're here to get you a degree and more important than getting a degree is say, why are you getting a degree? Do you want to become a nurse? Right now, there's a huge demand for nurses. I mean, it's tragic to me in, in you know, some disadvantaged communities, the dropout rate is like 60%. You know, we have single mothers, 20,000 bucks in student loans, and they don't even have a degree. It's, yeah. it, it's, uh, it's to me heartbreaking. And so it's it's at this point, like, and I was like, I love education. You want, I love math. You want to learn math? Go to Khan Academy. I, I'm I'm jealous of style. <laughs> There's nothing better than Khan Academy. I'm not looking to duplicate Khan Academy. I'm not looking to rip off Khan Academy. I'm telling you, please, you want to learn math? Please go to Khan Academy. Yeah. Now, you want to be a nurse? Maybe you're not so good at, at, at math, but to become a nurse, you need to take math. I'll give you a crash course in how to pass the exam. There's regulation. Society says you want to be a nurse, you need to take math. <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? It's yeah. like, and, and that's, and that's, I think, what is the confusion with Coursera's business model, which is that, you know, it's, you know, if you're taking a regular college course, it's really very, very difficult. And it's much more difficult if all I'm doing is clicking through a screen. It's not motivational. If I'm going to take like a high end course, a regular university course, and put it on Coursera and put through all of these traps. I have to do all the homework and I have to do all the tests. It's like, you know, my favorite joke is, you know, what do they call the last guy who is drinking his way through medical school? But he passed. They call him doctor. 
Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, my goal is, you know, I, I really, the reason I'm putting together videos is I want to inspire people to learn. I want people to learn Shakespeare because they, I happen to like Shakespeare. I want people to learn math. I want to learn math to know it. But they, I'm saying they reach a point in time where they say, you know what, I want to be a nurse. Yeah. And you know, to be a nurse, I have to take a math class and I don't right. like math. So let me, let me learn the regulations. I don't want you to cheat. There's, it's got to be proctored. That's why a certificate with no proctoring doesn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not here with the, you know, the Princeton honor code, you know, right. I mean, that's, that's right. cool. I like that. Princeton yeah. honor code. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so I'm going to tell New York state that I gave my students a degree and they should become a nurse because we hold by the Princeton honor code. And they, they told me they took the test. We're cool. But yeah. you know, <laughs> leg a legacy degree, we don't have the Princeton honor code. We actually have a proctor. We have exams that have been reviewed by the regulators. They comply with the regulatory requirements and they get you there. And I look like, you know, what is the regulatory requirement to pass math, to pass anatomy, to pass history? Yeah. to become an accountant. And like, it's the interesting thing is like, you know, a lot of people, it's interesting, I happen to be very academic. A lot of people who are much more successful than me, they're not academic. Sure. And that's the point is if society creates this barrier and we're here to say, what's the regulation? How do we get you over that barrier? Awesome. Love it. So maybe take me through, because we, we've been talking about like, you know, taking companies public and, and education, all these different things. So maybe take me through like, you, you, I think you mentioned that legacy and the whole education thing is still like a very new, relatively new concept, right? Like it's still like a, you know, building it and, and building it out. Is, is that, I'm not mistaken, yeah, right? I mean, we're, we're early stage in our path in yeah. terms of, of getting the business model going. Like I said, is, is, you know, my family business is actually, you know, quite successful. They have over 200 new students a, man, a month. They've, they've been involved in, I think, over 15,000 students getting an actual degree. So from my private family perspective, it's, it's a pretty meaningful business. Sure. So now, you know, to take it to be suitable for a larger environment, you know, I'm, I'm partnering with some people in, in Oklahoma. I'm talking to some people in Pennsylvania to take this, to be on that kind of a level where, you know, you don't have my family hand holding you. I have now an army of guys in the Philippines or I have some local people to do it. You know, obviously that's a task to take this family business and bring it to that next step. Right. So take me through like some things, maybe like, you know, are there goals and things like that over the next year, two years, whatever that, that may be, that you're hoping to accomplish to make sure that this business is going in the right direction? Right. So that, you know, that's actually really interesting. So it's funny when I first get started this path, you know, I jumped in with both feet. Um, I hired another CEO and we were very focused because I really believe in the underlying business model. Like I said, is I believe in the three pillars of business. One is the business itself. The second is capital markets. And the third is social media. Yeah. So what happened is, you know, we had resources. We're very grateful to the American government. The PPP program is amazing. That helped us keep the lights on, play our employees. And so we launched down the path of really launching the operations, you know, bringing back the live events on the entrepreneurial and real estate education, you know, working on doing the technology. And then I realized is that, you know what? You can't, as we say down in Texas, poo boy it. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta go big or go home. You know, yeah. and and this opportunity is so large that I'm not going to get there by organically growing, stepping out from my family business. You know, the family yeah. business is quite material, but you know, if I want to do this right, I need to have substantial revenue. I need to have real resources, and that's why we said, you know what, I'm not going to rush into half-baked product offering, I'm going to focus on actually telling our story. And so, you know, working with an investment bank, bring in capital, the story itself is worth being NASDAQ listed. I know how to run right. a NASDAQ company. Yeah. And then even most importantly, is before I even get to explain the business, like we're doing now, talking about the company, talking who we are to attract the capital, and we've embarked on a social media um, approach. And, and, you know, normally, you know, we have this, this young lady, uh, Whitney Chaffin, who's our, our brand manager and the head of marketing, she's podcasting left, right, and center. And, you know, one of my investors said, they don't want to see me on this. They want to see her. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized that, you know, what is, is, you know, you do need to see the CEO. And what I love, if you look in the world of valuation, of the stock market, one thing that's really interesting is that the consumer oriented companies have a very high valuation. Right. And the reason for that is that people kind of know what it is. 
So what I like about the education business is that investing social media is a way to reach our customers and also reach our investors. So at the same time, you know, we're doing this to get people interested in our company, invest in our company, hopefully buy the stock, you know, at 10 cents a share, $4 million valuation, you know, <laughs> come on guys. <laughs> you know, right, right. So to tell this story and say, you know, we want investment, we want people to hear who we are. At the same time, it's the same channel, obviously a little different emphasis in the podcast to explain to people, and you know, you can get an online degree. People didn't yeah. even know that. Yeah. You know, one of the young ladies who works for us, a really talented lady, you know, she, you know, she's getting a master's degree online before she even met me. And I'm like, that is so cool. Somebody working for the company is already familiar with online education. We're going to make her, you know, yeah. head of marketing as we build it out. Love it. Love it. So you're educating about education. That's, there you go. Hey, you, I'm good at this good. stuff. I'm you're, pretty good at this you stuff. You got two really two. big yeah. lines here. Guidance counselor <laughs> and educating about education. You know, oh, I love it. Yeah. We're good. Just send me the check. I'll send you my address. Um, okay. So um, the, where can people go as we come up to the end of this episode, where can people go to learn more about all the stuff that you're talking about? Um, you know, our website is a really good start, starting place. Um, uh, LegacyEducationAlliance.com. Um, you know, there's all kinds of information there and, you know, we're starting to, and we're going to put more on there. Um, we're actually doing something very interesting, which is the, um, our, entrepreneur education, which you just put club in front of it. So okay. club legacy education. And, uh, you know, we're, we're really investing in building out the content. So you keep looking and coming back and there's going to be more stuff. And, you know, I personally, I'm starting to, we have actually a YouTube channel, elite legacy education, where you, there know, you go. myself and Whitney are going to really start putting out more content to talk about what we're doing. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. So that uh, website and the club and the YouTube channel will all be in the show notes. Uh, Barry, thank you so much for coming out with us today, sharing everything. This was great. Great. I really, really push it. Look, look forward to coming back. And I'm very excited about it. Thank you for kicking off my podcast career. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And everybody else, thank you for listening. And we will catch you next time.